After subjugating some of the strongest members of the four great clans, Suping has continued to absolutely wreck everyone and everything in the way of his goal, to expand his pet store as much as possible and give his family a perfect life. On this quest, he just recently decimated the Lesser Joe clan for a plot against his store and killed a significant amount of their members. Since then, he's trained his sister to be as strong as possible so she can participate in the 52nd Annual Global Elite League. And much like her brother, Su Lingyu has absolutely dominated the competition right off the bat. With the first stage of the contest cleared, she's just now heading home after crushing a particularly sore loser. With the end of the first stage of the Elite League, the crowd and contestants alike are left in a state of awe. The disciple of the pastoral family, the guy who tried to take down Su Lingyu, lies in a crumpled heap in the field. The young woman has utterly crushed him in both spirit and body. As the swarm they've been avoiding floats over his body, people begin to understand the true terror of facing the little sister of Su Ping. Even Lu Fengxian of Jianlan Academy is clearly unnerved, despite his usual cool and aloof attitude. He'd imagine the rumors of how incredible Su Ping's pet store is to be just that, mere rumors. But with the champion recommended by said store being this powerful, he has to accept it. There may well be a great deal of truth in them after all. In the background, the conversation between others further pushes this belief into his mind. They keep going on about how Su Ping's pet store is the only true god of pet stores and Ping himself is incredible at what he does. Kinda of vague I know but you try deciphering these translations man. Anyway, Su Ling Yu just tunes out all the chatter and Kami walks out of the field, hands resting in her pockets. Up in the stands, both the Jian Lan and Feng Shen VPs, Yunchen and Dong Ming Song are clapping their souls out. After all, they've gotta suck up to Su Ping as much as humanly possible if they want to get their ways. Of course, that'd work a lot better if said pet store owner was actually there. When the old suck-ups turn to look at him, they find his seat empty without any trace of the man. Down in the halls of the tournament building, Su Ling Yu is walking through an empty corridor on her way to the exit. Worn out as she is from the challenge, she just faced an ace at the same time. All she really cares about is getting home. As such, when a bright red light suddenly flashes out from one side of the corridor, she writes it off as probably some old wiring or circuitry that's aged too much. Unknown to her though, the security room has been taken over. Oh wait, no. It's been undertaken. Get it? Because of the dead bodies and the hooded dudes their undertaker? No. Screw you guys. A mysterious hooded individual stands in the bloodied and messed up room dressed in a tank top. Mans has zero drip. Standing there menacingly, he wipes the blood of the security guards off of a short blade in his hand. Monologuing like your typical dollar store villain, he reveals he's here for Su Ling Yu. The reason being her audacity in competing against the four major families in this championship. Good lord why is everyone so pretentious in these series? Staring at a photo of the girl, he reveals his client's instructions are to remove her hands and feet from her body. Jesus Christ. Going even further, he notes that she's pretty cute, so he'll probably have some fun with her before doing that. As the image zooms out from the pedo's hand, it's revealed he's here with a large gang of his, all wearing the same hoods and tank tops. These fellas are in fact the Black Dog Team, a criminal mercenary group who take on jobs from the four great families on the regular, so they're protected from the law. Back with Su Ling Yu, she suddenly feels a hand grab onto her from behind. Startled, she instantly reacts violently and attempts to bash in her attacker's face. Luckily for both of them, the so-called attack is just Su Ping testing her reflexes and he catches her punch with ease. As she whines about his methods, Ping just tells her he's here to pick her up since she's been good. Turning around, he starts walking in the opposite direction. Confused, Ling Yu asks him why they're not taking the shorter route to the parking lot. In response, Ping tells her he checked that path and it's really dirty. He's called someone to clean it, but for now they're better off taking the other path. A quick cut to the shorter route shows a scene of absolute carnage. Little Skeleton is decapitating the black dogs and leaving behind a river of blood in their place. That's not terrifying at all. Once they make their way out of the building, Ling Yu and Ping are greeted by Master Swordsman Dao Zun. Slightly embarrassed, Dao Zun admits he's here to ask if Little Skeleton's free to train with him. For his part, Su Ping is shocked at the bond these two must have forged in the month he left them together. More than happy to have his pet get stronger, he chucks Little Skeleton over to Dao Zun and leaves. Back at the pet store, Su Ping arrives to the sight of three enormous crates sitting outside the entrance. His divine maid, Anna, is quick to inform him they're supposedly a gift from the Zhou family who have also sworn allegiance to him and placed an order for more than a hundred star pets to be nurtured. And all he have to do is crush them in their own territory. Neat. Though Anna looks down on the materials in the crates as garbage, they're actually some insanely valuable stuff by human standards. 
More importantly, they're key materials for one to get stronger. At Ling Yu's question, Ping turns to her and tells her the items are actually for her. With the three-day gap before the next event of the Elite League, she must absorb all the secret treasures there. Hearing this, another person speaks up from behind them. Ru Yan Tang has finally decided to step into the conversation. As she starts going on about how the sacred treasures are too high level for a commoner like Ling Yu, Su Ping has an idea. As the heiress of one of the four great families, she must have a pretty good idea of how they work. Suddenly, a sinister gleam enters Ping's eyes as his lips turn up in a menacing grin. Turning to Ru Yan, he asks her to come over to him so they can have a little chat. The very next scene we see displayed before us is of Su Ling Yu in a super revealing swimsuit, with her hands bound above her head with some rope, and she's being whipped by an equally semi-nude Ru Yan Tang with a glowing leaf, don't even ask. As Ru Yan continuously whips Ling Yu's exposed back with the leaf, the younger girl keeps crying out and moaning in discomfort, crying out that the action itches. Good God, this has turned into an entirely different kind of manhwa. For her part, Ru Yan simply tells Ling Yu to bear with her. After all, she's the one who was moving around too much. Of course, Ru Yan had to tie her up in such a provocative manner. If she didn't, Ling Yu would lose her mind in the cultivation process they're currently employing. And that's all they're doing. This is just the cultivation process. Definitely not tons of fan service. Author knew exactly what he was doing, goddammit. As the cultivation process goes on, Su Ling Yu can only scream out one question. Just what the hell is going on? We're in the same boat here. Thankfully, it's flashback time. An hour ago, we can see Su Ping, his sister, and Ru Yan Tang standing together next to the gift crates delivered by the Zhou clan. Eager to get started on working towards his goal of strengthening Ling Yu, Su Ping asks Ru Yan how the secret treasures are used to their full effect. Of course, petulant and stubborn as she is, the Tang family heiress refuses to tell him. She states that there's no good in telling him the answer to that question and asks if he'll let her go in return. That is to say, completely free her of the contract binding her to his store and by extension, him. Surprisingly enough, Su Ping answers that he will free her, after he's completely dominated and subjugated the entirety of the Tang family to bring them under his heel. There it is, standing off to the side. Su Ling Yu can only watch with a nervous stare, thinking that her big brother's starting to be more and more villain-like by the day. You're just noticing this now. But of course, Su Ping's words only feed into Ru Yan Tang's inherent need to boast about her heritage. While talking down to him for his status as a commoner and his title-level power, she starts rambling on about how he could never actually take down the Tang family. She goes on and on and on revealing things like the Tang family's large size and domain, just how much territory they span, how their base here in Longjiang City is simply a single branch and it rivals the other three great families. The woman seriously just won't shut up about her family. It'd be wholesome if it wasn't so arrogant and stuck up. Hell, at one point she just starts reciting the history and background of the family all the way from their inception centuries ago. It's at this point that Su Ping fully loses any interest and slash or patience he has left, with a single bead of sweat dripping down his exasperated face, he speaks to the system in his mind. He asks it if the contract he used to capture Joanna before can work on humans as well since it's clearly not limited to just star pets. Luckily for him, the system informs Su Ping that this is indeed the case, seeing as how technically all living beings are animals of some sort or the other. He can form the contract with a human, but their thinking capability will be reduced. That is to say, they'll retain all their knowledge and power but their ability to think for themselves will be decreased, and they'll be made to be much more submissive towards their master, so to speak. I can think of at least one person that would be really useful on. Evidently, the pet store owner feels the same way. Great minds think alike. While Ru Yan is still busy with her speech about the Tang family, Stu Ping suddenly takes a step towards her and says he wants to make a deal with her. Naturally, Ru Yan is startled by the sudden switch in attitude and asks what he wants to do. In response, Su Ping steps into her personal space, grabs her wrists to hold them above her head and proceeds to place a single finger on her forehead. As he's doing this, he tells her it's a pity he has to resort to such tricks, since they can't come to an agreement on their own. As Su Ping's finger leaves her forehead, a red symbol appears where it was placed. With this, a temporary contract between them has been signed. Confused by the lack of physical reaction, Ru Yan demands to know just what he's done to her. Rather than answering her question, Su Ping responds with one of his own. How does she feel about him now? The sudden question surprises Ru Yan and confuses her further. Even more concerning, as soon as she goes to reply to him normally, something takes over her senses completely. Even though she can see Su Ping in front of her, even though she can clearly feel her desire to kill him. 
For some reason, everything about him suddenly feels majestic to her. Irresistible, even. When he calls out her name next, she instantly falls to her hands and knees and asks what his orders for her are. Yep. Contract's definitely working then. Maybe a little too well, actually. Su Ping smirks down at her while his sister displays shock at the sudden switch in personality. Looking down at the now subservient woman, Ping tells Ru Yan to get up and act as normal. He actually kind of likes her usual rebellious self. Almost as quickly as she fell to her knees, Ru Yan is right back up and telling him to hurry up with his instructions. Su Ping tells her to explain how the secret treasures are used so he can train Ling Yu with them over the next three days. Unfortunately, Ru Yan reveals such a thing is simply impossible. Secret treasures can be divided roughly into three aspects. Each aspect takes a considerable amount of time. Just the first one, a medicinal bath exercise, takes about three months to complete. If the stages aren't all properly completed, Lin Yu stands at risk of her internal organs blowing up on her. Luckily, Su Ping has a way around this challenge, as he so often does in such situations. If he forms a contract with Lin Yu as well, she and Ru Yan can both enter his breeding slash training realms with him. And in the cultivation field, a full day is equal to just one hour outside. If they take advantage of that time dilation field, they can get 72 days of training in just three days in the real world. After convincing Ling Yu to trust him since he'd never bring her harm, he forms the contract with her and they head into the training realm. Back to the present, that promise ain't holding up too well. Ling Yu is thrashing around in agony as Ru Yan continues whipping her. Meanwhile, Su Ping just floats above them lost in meditation. By his calculations, if they use this field to train during every three-day gap between events, Ling Yu's training should be finalized by the time of the final event of the championship. Even as Ling Yu calls up to him for help, he tells her to just tough it out since there are worse places she could be and this training is a great privilege. Out in the real world, word of the Black Dog Group's destruction has reached the House of Shepherd who hired them. With the news of how brutally the group was cut down, the elders decide on a different approach. Deciding to have her taken out during the Elite League stages themselves, the Patriarch orders his men to eliminate her before the finals. As a reward, the one to get her will receive an Inferno Dragon Pet and two secret treasures. With how sought after both those things are, the men are instantly at the ready to destroy Ling Yu. Between them and the Tang family who want her beheaded, Ling Yu's future appears to be shrouded in darkness. The three-day gap period has gone by before anyone knows it, and the next stage of the Elite League is set to begin. The announcer from the primaries is on the scene and hyping up the crowd as things fall into place. All those who got through the primaries have now advanced to the preliminary rounds. Here, they've got massive five-player melee arenas set up for many battle royal-style fights. During these battles, the contestants will be observed and ranked based on their speed and adaptability. That is, their ability to take in their surroundings and fully understand whatever situation they may find themselves in. Additionally, it will also be testing their combat power, as one would naturally expect of a battle stage. The five-player melees will be held on one arena each and each of the assigned combatants will be allowed to bring up to two secret treasures with them for assistance. Anyone who surrenders loses. Anyone who falls unconscious loses. Anyone who is otherwise unable to continue fighting loses. Anyone who falls out of the arena loses. These battles are a true last man standing wins free for all between the five who will be duking it out amongst each other. On top of that, they're not even allowed to use any overly destructive moves as any damage to the ring is an illegal action. Sounds kinda cheap, but alright. Who am I to question the bigwigs? Now with the stages set and the lists of competitors released, it's time for everyone to line up and wait their turn. As the five-player melees officially start and all hell breaks loose on the stages, Su Ling Yu hangs back and observes everything that's happening from a safe distance. Up in the stands, Stu Ping once more finds himself sat in the middle of the two VPs of Jian Lan and Feng Shen, Yun Chen and Ming Song respectively. As they speak to each other, Su Ping absently listens in while sitting in a meditation pose. The elders are talking about a group of people who have come to their city from the starry sky. When Yunchen mentions their arrival, Ming Song seems startled. He asks if Yunchen is speaking of Star Organization, the strongest organization in their entire subcontinent which was founded by a legendary battle pet master. Yunchen says he's not sure about any of that but he does know nothing good comes out of being mere starry sky. According to something he heard, a large family in another city was completely wiped out last month because they possess a secret treasure that Starry Sky wanted. Their rampage even went as far as damaging the city's wall and almost triggered a wave of beasts. Ming Song can only be shocked that they caused such chaos over a simple secret treasure. All the while, Su Ping just quietly takes in all this info without any outward reaction. Down on the field, 
Su Ling Yu's turn to fight has finally arrived. Stepping up to her assigned battle arena, she locks eyes one by one with each of her opponents. A snake-like man named Zhang Xu, a bulky brute named Ma Zhang, and a hooded woman named Ji Shui. Each of the three start boasting about how she's unlucky to be facing them today, and she'd be better off simply surrendering now rather than getting hurt too badly. Of course, with the tutelage and faith of her brother entrusted to her, Ling Yu has no intention of backing down from anyone. Wait, isn't there supposed to be one more fighter? Suddenly, Ling Yu is met by a young boy cowering in fear of her opponents. Said young man is Yu Zijiang, the fifth and final competitor assigned to this particular melee arena. Ling Yu shows open distrust even towards the child, telling him not to act too friendly since they're enemies here as well. However, the boy simply wipes his tears and tells her he's just as much at risk of losing as she is if the others decide to team up. Taking that into consideration, they should team up as well, if only for their own survival. Smiling down at the kid for his sound reasoning, Lin Yu tells him she's alright with that. He clearly has a pretty sharp mind so she doesn't mind partnering up for now. The boy goes to shake her hand with a radiant smile on his face, overjoyed that she's accepted his proposal. However, as their hands come closer to each other's, an ominous gleam enters the boy's eyes and his expression shifts. This person is far from some harmless child. Using his innocent appearance, he's tricked more than his fair share of girls into bad situations. And now, he intends to do the same to Ling Yu. Held in his other hand behind his back is a secret treasure of a shepherd family, the Star Devouring Lock. Once it makes contact with a target, it seals off all their star power as long as they're under 6th level, without any way to unseal it. As soon as their hands meet, he reveals his true nature and brings the item out to slam Ling Yu's arm with it. Unfortunately for him, he just got rickrolled. Ling Yu saw through the deception from the very start and got one step ahead. Thanks to a paralytic toxin on a needle in her palm, Yu Zijiang was done the second he shook her hand. Moments before he can hit her with his secret treasure, he collapses, pricked with the toxin on her needle. As the secret treasure tumbles out his grasp and onto the floor in front of her, Ling Yu picks it up. The other contestants can only look on in shock at her actions. What if she was wrong and he'd actually been an ally? To this, Ling Yu has a simple answer. How could she be wrong? Ji Shui is of the Chen family. Jiang Shu is from the Tang. From the way they walk to how they breathe and their body language towards her, everything already identified them as enemies to her, especially with her brother's advice taken into consideration. That being that anyone from the four major families is to be shown no mercy. Infuriated at being made to look like fools, Ji and Jiang both summon their battle pets and send them at Ling Yu. While that happens, Ji starts bickering with a brute from the shepherd family, Ma Zhang, to summon his as well. However, in the few moments that pass with said bickering, their two battle pets have already been defeated by Ling Yu's snowball. Desperately clinging to some hope of beating the girl, Ji and Zhang both pull out their family's secret treasures and attack alongside their battle pets. Seeing the increased number of enemies, Ling Yu decides it's time to get serious. With a four-on-one battle, even Snowball might have a rough time. Pulling on a cord around her neck, Ling Yu suddenly undergoes a shocking transformation. Taking on features from her battle pet, Su Ling Yu now stands armed with feline eyes, claws and horns to match Snowball's own. Hang on, isn't that just the Nine Tails chakra? Okay, wrong franchise. Never mind. Finally, some decent translation. Gods be giving today. On with the story. As one. Ji and Zhang both leap at Ling Yu and Snowball with attacks at the ready. When they make contact though, all they hit is a whole lot of nothing. The Snowball they were seeing was just an illusion. From above, the targets suddenly fall upon them, ready to tear them to shreds. Sensing the two with just moments to spare, Ji shouts out a command to both Zhang and their battle pets. They shouldn't even bother attacking Shablaze, they should go for Shirley directly. A little context, Shablaze is Snowball and Shirley is Ling Yu. New translators be tripping. I'll just use the original names. Unfortunately for her opponents, Ling Yu is simply too fast for their attacks to hit. Weaving through every single one of their attacks, she activates a special move, Hellfire Claws and slashes the enemy battle pets clean through. Ji and Zhang are all but paralyzed with shock at what they're seeing. Despite being a mere human, Ling Yu is displaying feats of agility and power that are on par, hell even beyond. Grade 6 Battle Pets While they may not have any explanation for what they're seeing, someone else does. Watching the battle unfold from a distance, Ma Zhang recognizes the ability that Ling Yu is using. It is a secret pet taming art taught only to the highest ranking disciples of the Mu family. The usual relationship between a battle tamer and their astral pet is one where the tamer gives out commands orally. In such cases, 
the pet and master have a synchronization rate ranging from 40 to 60 percent. More experienced tamers who have spent years with their pets and can communicate with a simple stare can reach up to 90 percent. Theoretically, the ideal synchronization rate is of course, 100 percent. However, such a feat is only possible using the secret pet taming art of the Mew family which allows battle tamer and pet to have a mutual consciousness. The action is much like telepathy, allowing them to understand each other on a mental level. In that state, the pair can go as far as reaching not 1, but 200 percent synchronization rate. True to how overpowered that sounds, Lin Yu is just about to finish off a weakened and groveling Zhang Shu. Before she can deliver the final blow, she's grabbed by a massive shadow that appears out of nowhere. A dragon has appeared. This is the battle pet of Mahjong. The Abyss Crystal Dragon, ranked 15th in the entire dragon race and boasting a solid lower 8th grade combat power. This is the reason Mahjong refused to participate in the battle up until now. His plan from the start was to let Ji and Zhang tire her out while putting themselves at risk. Now that that's done, he plans to finish the girl off with the overwhelming power of his top-ranked dragon. Finally stepping into the fight, Ma Zhang tells Ling Yu her speed isn't too bad, but she's not quite fast enough. At his command, Abyss Crystal Dragon roars out, using a special skill Dragon Might. With this, Ling Yu is brought to her knees even though Snowball is able to stay up. Ma Zhang acknowledges the pet's strength and admits that the pet store that trained is quite commendable. However, such a thing is irrelevant now. Since Ling Yu's concentration has been broken, she can no longer maintain the resonance with Snowball and has returned to her normal state. Up in the stands, Yunchen and Ming Song are greatly disappointed by the current state of affairs. If Ma Zhang hadn't stepped in, their certain Ling Yu would have wiped the floor with her other opponents by now and won. Ming Song is particularly concerned by the fact that a mere contestant is in possession of the 15th ranked dragon. Back in the arena, Ji and Zhang are both feeling their smug attitudes returning. With Lin Yu brought to her knees, it's easy for them to start talking crap and claim her dominance was only because of the beast resonance she performed with Snowball. As the two inch closer to attack her, Lin Yu thinks up a plan on the fly to keep things from tipping too far out of her favor. With just a few well-placed words, she manages to convince Ji and Zhang that Mu Zhang is trying to take all the glory of beating her, despite them doing all the work of softening her up. I guess flattery does get you everywhere. Though Lin Yu's plan is to try and get them to team up with her to take out Mu Zhang, she is smart enough not to be completely fooled. Just barely, but she is. Holding Zhang back, she says that Lin Yu seems to have a card or two left up her own sleeve. That being the case, it's best for them to let her and Mu Zhang fight it out amongst each other. Then they can see what to do with the winner. Hearing this, Mu Zhang is enraged and yells out that he won't hesitate to kill him first. However, she just smirks at him and tells him they'll team up with Ling Yu to mess him up if he tries that. Getting him to position, Xi and Zhang start recovering with basic healing arts, leaving the battle between Ling Yu and Mu Zhang to continue. For his part, the Dragon Tamer is fuming at the unexpected turn of events. If it weren't for the rule against damaging the arena, he would have already pulled out his move, Meteoric Shower, and crush all three of the other competitors. As things stand though, he'll just have to play along. As he dashes towards Ling Yu with his dragon at his side, she prepares for the battle. If the plan to turn them all against each other failed, at least now she only has one opponent to deal with. Quickly, she commands Snowball to use Nightmare Beam. However, the Abyss Dragon has a small barrier surrounding it that blocks the beam entirely. Taking advantage of the enemy's short moment of vulnerability, the dragon bats Snowball aside with crushing claws. The pet goes flying, leaving Ling Yu alone to defend against the physical attacks from Mu Zhang. As a particularly nasty kick sends her skidding towards the edge of the arena, Snowball jumps in and blocks her from falling off. W Pet. Standing up, Ling Yu collects herself and weighs her options as Mu Zhang approaches. While driving might slows her down, Snowball is largely unaffected due to her extensive training. If she can just figure out why Nightmare Beam didn't connect earlier, she might still have a shot at winning this whole thing. While Ji and Zhang focus on healing themselves in the background, Lin Yu faces down an angered Mu Zhang. The brute tells her he'll offer one chance for her to give up willingly, and he'll leave her in somewhat decent shape if she does. Of course, Su Lin Yu has no intention of doing any such thing. Standing in place, she quickly goes over everything she knows about the situation in her head. Despite her snowball being a 7th order battle pet, his actual capabilities are well within the 8th order. That being the case, it's very much possible that Ma Zhang is using some kind of secret treasure that allows him and his pet to block out mental and illusionary attacks. Coming up with a plan on the fly, Ling Yu splits from Snowball and the two race towards opposite sides of the Mali Arena. Responding as expected, 
Ma Zhang races after Ling Yu while he orders his Ubbis dragon to go for Snowball. As the dragon races towards Snowball, Ling Yu commands her pet to use an illusionary attack again. However, just as before, a move has no effect and Ma Zhang says as much. Smutton is all hell about that fact. What he doesn't realize is he just gave away his biggest secret here to Ling Yu with his latest action. When Umbis Dragon blocks Snowball's attack, a faint blue glow appeared on the giant bone necklace thingy that Ma Zhang has placed around his neck. Ling Yu figures out what's happening pretty much instantly and calls out that it's Zhang's secret treasure that's causing her attacks to be ineffective. The seventh rank secret treasure of the Mu family, Dragon Sleeping Bone. When this thing is injected with star power from someone, it makes one dragon in their party completely immune to all negative status effects. Damn, that's kind of broken. Despite Ling Yu having figured out his secret, Ma Zhang isn't too concerned. He suddenly blurs out of place in a burst of speed and dashes past Ling Yu, slashing her midsection with a claw-like equipment on his forearm. Surprised by his sheer speed, Ling Yu is left on the back foot as Ma Zhang decides to get on the offensive side of things. While calling her an idiot for leaving her battle pet's side in her weakened state, he activates another move, a sixth-ranking battle technique of the Mew family, Butterfly Shadow Step. Copied from the eighth-ranking battle pet, it's a technique created by Heaven's ruined Snow Butterfly. Don't ask. With this technique, one can move at such high speeds that they appear as little more than a blur, their body shape appearing and disappearing without a trace. Using this move and uninterrupted by any of the battle pets, Ma Zhang blitzes Ling Yu in a brutal fashion, swiping at her over and over again from all possible directions. As Ling Yu falls to the ground from the damage she's just sustained, the announcer starts calling out that she can't continue, and that Ma Zhang really is the disciple of the previous champion, Muxia. Jeez, suck him off, why don't you? In the arena, Zhang simply wipes the sweat off his face with a smug grin. The butterfly step is a pretty heavily taxing and stamina draining technique, but it was clearly worth using. With the amount of blood Ling Yu is losing, he's pretty sure she's all but beaten already. Psych, she's completely fine actually. That is to say, she jumps back up and onto her feet after using advanced healing to completely recover from all her injuries and stand tall against Zhang. Back from their spot, Ji and Zhang are both shocked by how large the girl's arsenal is. On top of being a fighter with decent defense, she can even heal. That's gotta be some kind of hacks. Ling Yu herself those fully focused on her opponent and what she must do next. Staring at him with eyes cold as ice, she tells Ma Zhang to come at her again. Smug as ever, the guy tells her that her healing won't make a difference, he'll just have to dig her heart out to finish this for real. Dude, you. Activating Butterfly Shadow Step once more, he dashes towards Ling Yu. Quickly, he surrounds her with several after images created by the insane speeds he's moving at. As the after images multiply, Ling Yu closes her eyes and senses her surroundings to get a grasp on which is the real one. Suddenly, one of them leaps out of the group and goes to attack her from behind. Quickly dodging the attack, Ling Yu fires off a high kick in the man's face. Unfortunately, Ma Zhang's got an Uno reverse card up his sleeve, while Ling Yu's kicking what she thinks is the real him. Her kick goes through an after image and the true Zhang appears right behind her. Calling her an idiot, he thrusts his hand straight through her back eager to make good on his earlier threat of digging out her heart. Unfortunately, for him, he's not the only one with a reverse card. With a smirk on her face, Ling Yu reveals she moved just in time to catch his arm between her own arm and body. Now that he's stuck, she can carry out her own plan. She brings out the star eating lock secret treasure the kid from earlier tried to use on her and slams it on Ma Zhang's fist. Everything she did just now was nothing more than a ruse to get Ma Zhang in position to be hit with this thing. That's gotta be the sickest troll in this story so far. With all but his base human strength sealed away, Ling Yu easily body slams Zhang with an over-the-shoulder toss. Zhang yells out for his abyss dragon to save him, but Ling Yu is prepared. At her command, Snowball hits the dragon with Nightmare Beam. Without any star power, Zhang can't activate the secret treasure that was nullifying mental attacks, so the dragon is fully caught in the move and left incapacitated. With this, Things seem to be pretty much over as Zhang goes flying off the arena from Ling Yu's toss, and she would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for the meddling kids. That is to say, Ji Yin and Zhang who have just rejoined the battle and saved Ma Zhang from falling out the arena. With just how powerful they've seen her to be, the two have decided to stay allied with Ma Zhang and take her down. She crushes the secret treasure on his arm, granting him access to his star power once more. At his command, the now-recovered Abyss Dragon uses Dragon Might once more and pushes Ling Yu close to kneeling. 
With three opponents now rather than just one, things are looking pretty rough for Su Lingyu. That is until she hears a voice speaking into her mind. A very familiar one at that. Her brother is speaking to her telepathically. Sat between the two VPs as usual, he's forced to listen to them thinking his sister is just finished now. But he knows better, staring down at her. He tells her to use it. That there's no need to hide anymore and she can use her trump card. Obeying her brother, Su Lingyu moves to do just that. On the other side of the arena, John, G, Ma Zhang and their battle pets are staring down at her with smug expressions as she releases Snowball's summoning. They believe she's finally lost her will to fight and realize she has no chance. That's far from what's really going on though, and they'll soon find out. With just four silently uttered words, Lin Yu seals the fate of her opponents. She orders, come out little white. With that, a giant white dragon is summoned out of nowhere. As soon as it materializes, the beast uses the ninth level pet skill, frozen thousands of miles. Even as her opponents stand in shock at the sight of the beast rank 8th in the entire dragon race, the skill shoots at them. In just a moment, they're all frozen rock solid and Ling Yu is declared the victor of her bout, cold. With the crowd left in awe of Ling Yu's latest summon battle pet, the announcer slash commentator scrambles to explain what just happened. Ling Yu's pet, a silver frost Xing Yu dragon is one of the strongest of its race. It is said there is such a dragon which used the same move as what they've just seen to continuously freeze everything around it for a radius of thousands of miles. Today, they've seen this very move for themselves, albeit a weaker version for obvious reasons. Hell had even managed to leave the arena itself unharmed. As such, Ling Yu is the undisputed winner of this bout. As Ling Yu leaves the area, the audience breaks into murmurs amongst themselves about how impressive her dragon is. Many are simply envious of her for possessing such a powerful pet at such a young age. Up in the stands where Su Ping is sat, the VPs on either side of him are, as usual, sucking up to him like nobody's business. The man himself seems to have no reaction though, simply looking forward with a blank expression on his face. Later that night, Su Ling Yu visits Ru Yan Tang in her room at the pet store. When the older woman acts annoyed by her presence, Ling Yu quickly gets to the point. Bringing up her hands, she presents a box of delicious-looking cupcakes to Ru Yan. Ribery, that's dope. She tells Ru Yan that she's eager to train more in the future. Ru Yan, of course, as is the norm with her, instantly gets a smug and haughty expression, looking down on Ling Yu. While reminding her of their last training, she asks Ling Yu why she's suddenly so willing to undergo something like that again. Could it be she now has feelings for her teacher? Man, this woman is on some freaky stuff. What the hell even? Ling Yu is quick to tell her that's not the case. It's just that after her battle in the latest stage of the Elite League, she's realized just how wide the gap between her and the strongest pet tamers is. In just a month, she became so much more powerful than before thanks to Su Ping's methods and yet she fell into one tough situation after another in the arena battle. If she's going to make her brother proud and walk beside him, she has to get stronger. Infuriatingly pompous as ever, Ru Yan just chomps down on one of the cupcakes while telling Ling Yu to be more specific. What exactly does she want to learn? Aren't you supposed to be the teacher here? Figure it out, woman. Luckily, Lin Yu does in fact have an idea of what precisely she wants to work on. Having been struck with the power of Ma Zhang's dragon and forced to let go of her connection with Snowball, she wants to increase her mental power first. Surprisingly, Ru Yan actually compliments her approach, telling her it's a great idea. According to her, mental power is the single most difficult attribute for any battle pet master to improve. The difficulty of such is the main reason why even 8th level pet masters can only form contracts with 4 or 5 pets at a time. The mental power required for more than that simply exceeds their capabilities. Luckily for her, the Tang family has a secret technique she can use. Ru Yan tells Ling Yu to try calling out her dragon pet here and now. Ma'am, you're indoors. Do you want to become homeless? Ling Yu voices the concern about the dragon's size, but Ru Yan just assures her such a thing is not an issue. She just needs to use a specific summoning method to keep from calling out the full dragon. After guiding her through the process, Ru Yan is pleased to find Ling Yu able to summon forth her dragon's upper body with ease. For some reason though, as soon as it's summoned, the Silver Frost Star Moon Dragon unleashes an attack on Ru Yan. Can't blame it, she's just that annoying. I'd attack her if I could. Though Ling Yu is on the verge of freaking out at her teacher being attacked, Ru Yan reveals a technique that blocks the dragon's attack with surprising ease. Ling Yu is completely floored by what she's just seen. Ru Yan tells her student that the technique she just used is not only great for providing physical defense, but also for boosting mental defense. With this, she should be able to fight off any attacks that might break her connection with Snowball. 
It's not perfect, but for now it should be a pretty solid method of doing what she wants. In order to teach her the move though, Ru Yan first demands something in return. More bribes. Nice. Unknown to Ling Yu. Ru Yan has a much more selfish motive behind teaching her this technique. Why am I not surprised? Once Ling Yu learns this technique, the immovable crystal body, the Tang family will recognize and try to recruit her. When that happens, she herself will finally be able to escape Su Ping's store and return to her family. Yeah, something tells me that won't happen, but we'll see I guess. Outside Ru Yan's room, Su Ping can be seen listening in from under a soundproof barrier of star power. I freaking called it man. Before him are the elders of the four families who are now all but his personal servants. Each of them reports on the activities of their respective families. The Shepherd and Chen family see Su Ling Yu as a threat and rival respectively, so there'll likely be trouble further down the road. On the other hand, the Tang family are still busy searching for Ru Yan Tang, so it's quite possible they'll become an enemy too once they learn Su Ping is the one holding her captive. Surprisingly enough, it's the Liu family alone whose patriarch has decided to remain neutral and refrain from drawing the anger of Su Ping and his sister. Before leaving them, Su Ping tells the elders to take care of Xu Kuang during this next three-day gap period. He himself is going to be busy with Starry Sky, or rather, Xing Kong, the strongest organization in the continent closing in. He must get as strong as possible. To this end, Su Ping meets with Joanna for their weekly trip to the godly realm so he can soak in the divine spring. Joanna attempts to trick him into taking her to the realm of the Supreme God, but Su Ping sees right through her and realizes she was eavesdropping on his prior conversation. When Joanna realizes she's been caught, she tells Su Ping of a different way to get stronger fast. It's quite simple, really. All he has to do is rob the heavens. What the hell? The method Joanna speaks of is known as the Heavenly Tribulation, and it's much less apocalypse-inducing than she made it sound. Rather than literally having to rob the heavens, one has to complete a trial of sorts. The heavens themselves, who maintain the balance of the universe itself, bring down a catastrophe upon a cultivator whose level keeps progressing. This catastrophe is what the heavenly tribulation is. If a cultivator is able to survive the heavenly tribulation that is brought down on them, they have the chance to ascend to the legendary tier. Right now, as Joanna and Su Ping arrive at the site of the tribulation, one such cultivator is already trying his hand at it. Standing atop the mountain where the tribulation occurs, this man has only one goal today. To survive the tribulation and become a formal member of the Nirvana 7th Major Squad, which is like, one of the army factions of the Divine Realm I'm guessing. They don't really explain this stuff very well, do they? Anywho, Mr. Nirvana Wannabe activates his special move, the Divine Bull Physique, as a tribulation strikes down upon him. Thunderclouds with a radius of 10 miles crack down upon his body with unrestrained bolts of lightning. From a good distance away, Su Ping finds himself shaking with apprehension at the devastating feeling given off by the tribulation. Joanna, on the other hand, gives no visible reaction and just says it's a pity they've arrived late. She suggests that Su Ping just hijack Bold Eye's tribulation, but he tells her to hang on. He might as well get used to the feeling of it first since he's got time. Offhandedly, he mentions hiring someone to create a web page for the store. Need to take online orders if he's going to lighten his mom's workload after all. She's the only one working there right now since Ru Yan and Ling Yu are busy with the younger girls training too. A little way away from them. Su Ping hears some members of the Nirvana squad commentating on Bold Dude's tribulation. Listening in on their conversation, Ping learns that they refer to the potential mentioned by his system as talent. The more a person's talent, the larger the radius of the thunderclouds they can cause as part of their tribulation. Considering his own pets only have average potential, Su Ping can't help but be curious just how large the thunderclouds for the tribulations may be. Suddenly, Bull Guy folds, like literally folds in two almost, hunched over on the mountain top. The tribulations prove to be too much for him and he's been overwhelmed by it, laying there, fried like an egg and barely alive. His powers have been fully stripped from him, leaving him all but useless. The Nirvana quad below despair for the man and comment on how even the C-tier treasure he was using couldn't block the effects of the tribulation completely. The man himself loses himself in anguish over his failure and proceeds to kill himself. Don't try that at home, kids. There's always tomorrow. Over with our main man, Supin can't help but feel concerned by the viciousness of the tribulation. If not for the protection granted to him by the system, that would have reduced him to nothing more than ashes. Joanna explains that an individual's talent affects the strength of the heavenly tribulation and also signifies the limits of one's growth. However, if one's combat power isn't up to par, they won't pass the tribulation. It's as simple as that. Retreating to his own thoughts, Su Ping thinks of his pets and realizes that even Little Skeleton, his strongest pet by far, only has a C-tier combat level. 
Same as the guy that just got electrocuted. So that's not really ideal. On the other hand though, the earnings from his store these days are pretty damn crazy. At worst, he can just abuse the system's revive mechanic over and over again if he fails. How responsible of him. Suddenly, a giant divine being appears before Ping and Joanna, bowing down to the goddess. He tells her it's his turn to cross the tribulation. This is exactly what they've been waiting for. Joanna hands him a large shield with the face of Achilles carved upon it. This is, well, the Achilles shield. Apparently, the gods aren't very creative. Who knew? A celestial tear treasure forged from the body of a god. Three guesses which one, it has impenetrable defenses and protects its user from all damage. As the giant starts rambling about how honored he is to wield such a treasure, the face on the shield starts talking. Yeah, why not? Joanna tells the giant that Su Ping will be borrowing his heavenly tribulation, so it's her responsibility to keep him alive. With tears in his eyes, the giant vows to protect Su Ping at all costs as they fly up to the mountain peak. Once they're at the peak, the giant tells Su Ping to stay behind him so he'll be protected. With a treasure like the Achilles shield, they can easily withstand even a 50-mile thundercloud. The face decides to get offended by that and claims even a 100-mile cloud wouldn't be a problem. Down below the mountain, as the thunderclouds start amassing, the gathered divine beings ask Joanna if she's sure about letting a human face the tribulations. After all, a mortal being will be incinerated by just the first strike, let alone the whole catastrophe. Just as they voice their doubts, Joanna says to look up. The color of the tribulation has changed. As the onlookers watch on, the thundercloud of the red-colored tribulation grows further and further in size. First three, then five, and seven miles, being thrice as strong as a regular tribulation. This makes it equal to a normal 21-mile heavenly tribulation. And it isn't even done growing yet. Up on the peak, the reactions are considerably different from the shock and awe down below. Achilles is simply boasting about how this is nothing more than a minor tribulation to one of his power. They must be pretty damn weak if they need him for this. Just you wait, old man. You'll be eating those words soon enough. The giant sent with Su Ping eats up the shield's words, though, believing it to be their great savior in this terrible situation. With a relieved smile on his face, he tells Su Ping to hurry up and get under the shield with him. The first strike of the tribulation is about to hit. Taking in his words, Su Ping decides to summon forth his dark dragon dog, Umbrageddon. Yeah, they've got actual names now. God bless the new translator. At Su Ping's command, Umbrageddon unleashes his power, causing the thunder cloud above them to grow even further. Slowly but surely, it expands to 8 miles, then 9, then 10, then a whopping 11. Finally, it settles at 27 miles. Speaking out from his place on the face of the shield, Achilles claims that this is only now just starting to get interesting. They better keep going though, or he's just going to fall asleep from boredom. Cocky old coot. Surprised but pleasantly so, Su Ping continues summoning his pets. The next to come out is Lunar Dragon, the beast Ling Yu used at the end of her five-person melee stage. God, these new names are so much nicer than before. With the summoning of Lunar Dragon, the thunder cloud expands even faster. Blowing past the 30-mile mark, then even the 40-mile mark, it finally settles on 50 miles. Su Ping is rather surprised. Despite having a combat power lower than that of Umbrageddon, Lunar Dragon's talent has expanded the Thunder Cloud even further than the dog did. Guess he really does deserve his spot in the top 10 ranked dragons. Next, he summons Blazicon, his purgatory dragon. With Blazicon's emergence, the Thunder Cloud straight up doubles in radius this time. In just moments, it reaches a full 100 mile radius. Even the giant sent with him is terrified by the power on display before him. Just how many pets does Su Ping have? Clearly a lot. With the greatly increased size of the heavenly tribulation, even the onlookers a good distance away are at risk. The sheer destruction soon to be brought on is of such a massive scale that even they aren't safe. When they ask Joanna to move further away, the goddess simply tells them to go ahead. But she's staying. After all, she's seen plenty of heavenly tribulations of this level before. She's old old. Despite her seemingly carefree attitude, Joanna is rather concerned about Su Ping and her servant who's with him. At this rate, she'll need to give them one more boon to get through what's about to happen. As she raises her hands to the sky, the golden light shines forth and deposits an item in her hands. This is the personal true godly treasure of the goddess. As soon as it's fully in her grasp, she shoots it straight at the mountain peak for the giant to catch. When the giant reveals what it is, Su Ping is happy to see he was right about her. She still had more hidden cards up her sleeves. Now that's been revealed though, it looks like he can really let loose. In one final portal, Su Ping summons forth his oldest and strongest pet. 
Little Skeleton has made his way onto the scene. Or as this incredible new translator calls him, Skelly. Naturally, with the addition of yet another pet of such insane power, the thundercloud grows larger than ever. The divine beings with Joanna are practically tumbling over each other in their attempts to flee the scene. Before anyone knows it, the heavenly tribulation has become a 200-mile thundercloud. Finally, even Achilles himself displays the beginnings of fear in his expression. At this point, he has to admit even he hasn't seen anything like this in the past. From the looks of it, he's going to have to sacrifice himself to save them. Suddenly, the first strike of the tribulation comes down upon them in the form of massive lightning bolts. Quickly, Stuping and his pets get behind the giant and the Achilles shield in his grasp. Luckily, the shield is more than capable of defending them from that, never mind. Su Ping's pets leap headfirst into the lightning, dying all at once. That's rough, buddy. Joanna's servant is just about to freak out over what's just happened when Su Ping reveals that it doesn't matter either way. Even if they are killed, he can simply do this. With just two words, Su Ping resurrects all of his fallen pets, raising them back up to their full power in but a moment. As they all get into their own menacing positions, Su Ping tells the giant that they're all experts at getting beaten up, so he should just defend himself. That's kind of masochistic, not going to lie. Very sus. Although he's marveling at the life-restoring ability Su Ping just displayed, the giant tells him they still can't let their guards down. What they just experienced was only the first strike of the tribulation. In total, they're going to have to face nine of them, with each one being stronger than the last. Well, that doesn't sound fair and all, does it? Oh well, Su Ping's gonna crush this either way. Sure enough, strike after strike rains down from the thundercloud above, each one greater in power than the last. And just as sure, Su Ping and his pets firm their way through all of it. If you can count literally dying and getting revived as firming it. When the third strike comes down, Su Ping doesn't even wait for his pets and leaps at it himself. With a full powered demonic fist, he crushes the strike, allowing them to move on to the next. Over and over, they die, resurrect, and then repeat the process as the strikes pass. By the time they've reached the ninth and final strike, Su Ping has exhausted his mental energy. He can no longer resurrect himself or his pets. So close to clearing the tribulation, Su Ping can only despair at the thought that this will be his end. Luckily, they've still got one last bit of plot armor to rely on. One that he seems to have forgotten. With a cry to not give up, the giant throws something to Su Ping. Catching it, he realizes it's Joanna's treasure. This is the Prism Star Core, a godly tier treasure forged from the core of a mythical beast. Using this allows the wielder to access an all but limitless supply of energy. As he activates it, a golden aura flares to life all around Su Ping. Standing stronger than ever, he yells out that his reserves are overflowing. As the power of the Prism Star Core flows into his body, Su Ping realizes it's providing benefits beyond just the near infinite wellspring of energy. Thanks to its blessing, both his Golden Crow God Demon Physique and Demon Suppressing God Fist have temporarily gone up by a level each. On top of that, he then pulls out a technique that was unlocked some time ago. Through the special bond he shares with Little Skeleton, Su Ping is able to take on a whole new form by fusing with him. Before the transformation can be finalized though, the system brings him to his internal world. Here, he must choose which of Little Skeleton's skills he wishes to wield in their combined form. Thinking on the way things have been going so far, Su Ping has to admit that he's just been too limited overall when it comes to his ability to last against the Tribulation. But right now, he has access to near limitless power thanks to the Prism Star Core. Using that power, he should be able to combine his Golden Crow Flesh with Little Skeleton's ability to restructure broken and severed limbs. A combination like that will allow him to keep fighting damn near no matter what happens. With his mind made up, Su Ping chooses the regenerative ability. With this, he should be able to take the absolute maximum advantage of the Tribulation's power boost. Out in the real world, Su Ping is transformed into his beast soul overlay form. In this, he appears as a demonic tyrant of terrifying power. And to be fair, that's pretty much what he is as well, as we'll soon get to see. A massive red hand suddenly descends from the thunderclouds and comes straight at Su Ping. Before it can hit, Umbrageddon and Blaziken both apply practically a laundry list of defensive buffs to Su Ping. From rock armor to wind shield and lightning coat, he's pretty much coated in every elemental defense possible. With said buffs applied, Stu Ping makes what is perhaps the boldest move since he was reincarnated into this life. He steps forward and grabs the massive fist. No, really, he literally plants his feet into the ground and shoves his hands right into the oncoming fist to stop it. And with a considerable amount of effort, he even manages to bring it to a standstill. Though it's causing a terrible pain within his very soul, 
Su Ping just smiles maniacally at what he's achieved. From some distance back, the giant who accompanied him is now cowering behind the Akili shield, absolutely shell-shocked by the sheer nerve of this human. To go up directly against the heavenly tribulation. Such a thing is unheard of. Unfortunately for him, his cover's about to disappear. Achilles finds himself excited beyond anything he's been in a while at what he's seeing. Eager to be part of it, he tells the giant to stay where he is and flies off towards the titanic clash taking place up ahead. Suping is fairly surprised as well when suddenly, the Achilles shield straps itself to his chest and tells him to go all out with confidence. It'll lend its defensive capabilities to him with pleasure. With Achilles' power added to his own, even the pain Suping previously felt is no more. With nothing left to hinder him, he bellows at the heavenly tribulation to be destroyed by him. Summoning the full spectral avatar of his golden crow body and demonic suppression fist, Su Ping and the catastrophe have a realm-shattering grapple for dominance. As the two cosmic entities grapple, the fists on Su Ping's avatar are shattered. But this right here is exactly where Little Skeleton's skill comes into play. If one punch won't do it, he'll just keep restoring his fists and hit with a hundred punches. True to his claim, Su Ping absolutely batters the catastrophe with blow after blow after blow until cracks start appearing in its visage. Over from where they're observing, even the divine beings have to acknowledge Su Ping's power and show a newfound respect for him. On the other hand, Joanna is focused only on Su Ping's fists. Recognizing them, she wonders how he's related to the Golden Crow clan of the ancient chaotic period. Back at the heart of the clash, Su Ping cracks his fist against the catastrophes in one final, full power clash. And well enough, his monstrous power boosted by Joanna's treasure is the victor. The catastrophe is shattered into pieces and the sky clears up in a massive swirl energy. The heavenly tribulation has been completed. As he descends to the ground, Su Ping and Little Skeleton separate back into their individual forms. When Joanna arrives to ask how he feels, he reveals that the countless destruction and reconstruction of his body have made it stronger and lighter than ever before. Even his star power level has risen from lower 6th order to 6th order peak. There is one thing that Su Ping hadn't expected though. He can now see a golden progress bar above his companion, the giant's head. The system explains this is an enlightenment bar that allows the acquirement of the skill every time it fills up. Su Ping can only now see it as he accidentally touched the Thunder Dao in his battle with the catastrophe of the Heavenly Tribulation. He can now grant Thunder Dao skills to anyone with a full enlightenment bar. Sure enough, the second Su Ping thinks about it, he feels the knowledge of countless lightning skills running through his mind despite never learning them. According to the system, there are a total of 999 skills, most of which he will learn to grant with time and experience. Sometime later, Su Ping has summoned Lunar Dragon and Umbrageddon in his store. Since both of them have filled out enlightenment bars displayed above their heads, he plans to grant some nifty new skills to them. Since Umbrageddon is lacking defense, he grants it the 773rd Thunder Dao skill, Thunder and Murder Domain. With this, all enemies who step into a 10-meter radius of Umbrageddon will be strangled with the power of the Thunder God. For Lunar Dragon, it needs a precision attack, something it can use to deal massive damage to a single target quickly rather than AoE attacks. With this in mind, he grants it the 689th Thunder Dao skill, Wind God's Thundering Arrow. This highly powerful precision attack is capable of completely ignoring all defensive skills between itself and its target. With this, both pets have been raised to a whole new level of combat usefulness. Since the next stage of the Elite League is soon, he'll probably be lending Umbra Geddon to Shu Quang. The day of the final event for the Global Elite League's qualifying rounds has arrived. A full 1,000 contestants have made their way through the arena battle stage and to this one. In the upper city's Longjing Central Arena, these thousand contestants must now duke it out to find the finest among them. As the spectators take their seats and the contestants assemble, the announcer explains how exactly this will be working. All 1,000 candidates will be participating in what is known as the Nightmare Hunting Competition. What exactly is this? Well, it's quite simple really. Imagine Sword Art Online meets PUBG or COD or Fortnite. Honestly, pretty much any Battle Royale game works. Because that's what this is. The contestants will be sent into a virtual, or rather, a dream world of sorts. To do this, the League will be making use of a modified version of the Ubbis Nightmare Beast, a higher 9th grade combat power possessing creature with some insane abilities. This beast will lead their consciousnesses into a dream realm where they can battle it out without any limitations. The system for determining winners will be a point-based one. If you kill another contestant who has no points, you get one point. If you kill one who does have points, well, you get all of their points. 
Any contestants who die in the dream realm will automatically be eliminated and will be woken up from their slumber. Finally, when the battle ends, the five contestants who have the highest number of points will be the ones who move on to the finals. The time limit for this stage is five hours, and all contestants are allowed to use a single secret treasure. It does have to be one that's of a lower rank than their own combat power, though. Can't have them being carried by their equipment now, can they? Oh, and one more thing. Screw campers. That is to say, in order to ensure no one's able to make use of that rather cheap tactic, the players with more than 100 points will be displayed on the map at all times for everyone to see. With all the rules and conditions explained, it's time for the battle royale to begin. All at once, the contestants laying in their individual pods are dozed with sleeping gas, sending them quite firmly into unconsciousness. As soon as they leave the waking world, they're transported into the dream world by Abyss Nightmare Beast. Out in the real world, Su Ping's watching from a seat in the stands when VP Dong Ming Song makes his appearance. Walking up to Su Ping, he tells the man that he needs a specific pair of VR goggles to spectate the battle. Handing one to him, Ming Song takes the seat next to Su Ping. Sure is a coincidence that they're both here. Yeah, Dong definitely didn't spend a million just to get this specific seat. Definitely didn't do that. Anywho, using the VR goggles created with a specific brand of biotechnology, Su Ping busies himself with surveying the dream world and what's happening within it. Inside said dream world, Su Ling Yu has just landed and has similar plans. Removing her hairpins, she reveals them to be a secret treasure of the sixth grade, mechanical bird. Unable to be detected by star power, the bird can move around swiftly and scout an area of roughly 20 miles around the user. Pretty neat. Almost no time has passed before Su Ling Yu already hears a massive commotion from a clearing not far from her. Over in the clearing, Two contestants can be seen battling it out against each other with their star pets out. More interesting, however, is the third contestant, one who's laying hidden in the grass a pretty decent distance away from them. Laying in a prone position, he's using a grade 6 biotechnology treasure, Beast Sniper. Oh my lord, he's one of those. Someone kill him, please. As he looks down the scope of his sniper to take out the two, the man sees something terrifying. The upside-down face of Su Ling Yu in her transformed state. The one where she bonds with Snowball and she has horns and whiskers, and claws. Yeah, that has to be pretty terrifying to see just inches away from you. Staying true to her demonic visage, Ling Yu snaps the sniper's neck in a brutal fashion and flips onto a nearby tree, all with a rather disturbing grin on her face, really going all out with the whole demon cosplay thing, isn't she? Taking a seat on the tree branch, Ling Yu sees she's gained five points from killing that guy. Realizing how effective this could be, she comes up with a simple strategy. The battle between the two guys nearby is pretty much a stalemate. Since it won't be ending anytime soon, it'll attract plenty of other contestants here as well. Ling Yu plans to stay hidden in her spot and kill all the people that show up quietly. Then, once she has more than 100 points and can't camp anymore, she'll use the Lunar Dragon trained by her brother to fight anyone else she comes across head-on. Later, five golden beams of light shoot up into the sky from various spots in the Dream Realm. In just one hour since the beginning of the battle, five contestants have crossed the 100-point threshold. And funny enough, all five are the heirs of the prestigious families, including the four great ones. Out in the real world, a spectating Su Ping learns the reason for this from Dong Ming Song. This is an old practice in the Elite Li's Battle Royale stage. The heirs of major families have an agreement to meet up at the very center of the map they're sent to. From there, they all split off into different directions, by doing this, they can ensure none of them have to face each other during the battle royale and can save their face-offs for the finals. Su Ping comments that it's rather unfair since they're manipulating the rules to make sure the finalists are only from the great families. Dong is quick to assure him though that there aren't really many people who even could rival those guys anyways. Speaking of which, where's Lady Ru Yan of the Tang family this year? Yup, that one's a real mystery. Su Ping sure doesn't know what you're talking about. Back in the dream world, one of the top five contestants is seen absolutely smoking the competition. With a couple of weaker guys in tow, he can be seen cutting down opposing players with incredible skill. This is the young master of the Liu family, now boasting a shocking 148 points. The two with him, children of rich men who bought the Liu family's protection, waste no time in sucking up to him despite his distaste for it. Meanwhile, Lin Yu has still only reached a total of 42 points, far behind those in the lead. As she continues hunting players and the heirs of the great families do the same, a six golden beam suddenly appears. Another contestant has reached 100 points. The announcer gets excited by this revelation and starts taking guesses as to who it could be. One of those guesses being Ru Yen Tang. Yeah, fat chance of that one, chief. 
As everyone wonders just who it is, this sixth contestant is suddenly revealed in a violent display of wild power, barreling through tens of players at once, with a total of 137 points, riding atop the back of none other than Umbregedin, Ishu Kwang. 